Good afternoon, boys and girls. Uh, we're going to pick up with Making Bombs for Hitler, Chapter 14. And when we last left Lida, she had come back with the other girls from Making Bombs. And all of the Eastern workers that were at the camp died. Um, they were poisoned. So the Russian soup was poisoned. And Lida realized that if she would have been... If she would have still been in camp, then she would have been dead as well. Julie managed to find some shoes off of one of the one of the prisoners that was killed and gave those to Lida. And so Lida is taking all that that's happened and everything in and realizing that there's dirt that looks a lot like the powder that goes into the bombs. So thinking about maybe um, sabotaging some of those bombs so that they can't kill. And her last, her last statement is she vows that the Nazis will pay for this because they should have thought twice before having slaves make their bombs. So we're going to pick up a chapter 14, which is called Scrap of Light. When 1944 arrived, we did nothing in the camp to mark the new year. Maybe the camp guards and the police had extra food. Maybe they toasted one another's good health. For us, it was a usual Friday night. I went to bed and tried to sleep. I tried not to think of the possibility of spending another year making bombs for Hitler. Ukrainian Christmas Eve was the following Thursday, and those of us in Barracks 7 sang hymns together as we lay in our bunks, shivering under our covers. Just a year ago, I had been with Larissa and my grandmother. Back then, I thought things couldn't get worse. I was an orphan, after all. Looking back now, I realized how I should have been thankful for all that I had. Not much food, no parents. But we had a roof over our heads and the love of our grandmother. As January blizzards blew outside, I was grateful for my shoes. In the factory, the man behind the glass stopped paying so much attention to us. He would bring in the daily newspaper and read every page. I would glance over and see him engrossed in the latest news from the front, not looking our way for 15 minutes at a time. Every once in a while, he would leave. Sometimes he would be gone for only a minute or so, but there were times when he was gone for half a day. We sensed the war was turning very bad for the Nazis. Some of the changes were subtle. German supervisors in the factory simply stopped showing up. In their place would be German housewives who seemed wholly unprepared for the job they were supposed to do, or boys in Hitler's youth uniforms who were eager but untrained. I lived in hope that the man behind the glass would abandon his post as well, but although his absences became longer and he paid scant attention to us while he was there, he always seemed to eventually come back. But in those times that he was gone, we had the opportunity for sabotage. Each morning, we filled our pockets with dirt from the camp. Then, even with the supervisor reading the paper, it was possible to slip my hand into my pocket and fill the metal bowl with dirt instead of gunpowder. Natalia's trick could only be done when the supervisor was gone. She would dampen the inside cavities of the bomb with the icy fluid. The gunpowder was that was inserted after it after that was spoiled, we hoped. One morning we came in and the supervisor was gone. On his desk were a day old newspaper and a dirty coffee cup. Perhaps he would finally not come in at all. We used his early absence to sabotage bombshell after bombshell. Natalia gave the barrel of gunpowder a good soaking with her cooling liquid. She sprayed fluid all over the straw-like corded as well. We made the bombs out of this destroyed material and included scraps of paper upon which Bibi wrote in several languages, Dear Allies, this is all we can do for you now. Shortly before lunch, the supervisor came back. We had just closed up one of the bombs we'd tampered with. I had a very hard time keeping my face serious. I felt so exultant. I was positively giddy for the fact that we had succeeded in destroying so many bombs. Had we, bo had he bothered to glance into our room, he might have noticed the cordant glistening, but he didn't look. 
Instead, he opened up his briefcase with trembling fingers and began frantically stuffing papers into it from his desk. Without glancing at us even once, he left, stray papers fluttering behind him. With him gone, we continued to make fake bombs. At midday, we joked together as we hung up our smocks, then washed up as usual. I was grateful when the kitchen worker came in with our soup. So many Germans seemed to be fleeing. Our turnip soup was not filling, but it was the only thing keeping us alive. Just as I held a, pa a spoonful of watery turnip to my lips, the room was enveloped in a loud boom. A gust of air whooshed in from above with such force it blew me off my chair. My spoon flew out of my hand and smacked against the wall. I scrambled to my feet, trying to make sense of what had just happened. When I looked up at the ceiling, my heart stood still. Where gray tiles should have been, there was a huge star-shaped hole. That's when I looked immediately below the hole. Our table. Sticking up in the middle of it was the narrow end of a small bomb, firing pins pointing upward. Time stood still. For one long moment, I stared at the bomb, comparing it to those we were making. This was similar in size and color, but teardrop-shaped instead of oblong. All at once, I came to my senses. This bomb that had been dropped in on us, it hadn't exploded. Yet. Out, I screamed. Now. The other girls seemed as stunned and confused as I was. I scrambled to my feet and ran to the door that connected our room to the catwalk above the factory. I pulled on the handle. Mercifully, it was unlocked. Xenia, Mary, Bibi, Natalia, Katerina, and I all flew out, yanking the door closed behind us. We stumbled down the catwalk as quickly as our feet would take us. When we were nearly at the other end of the factory, the ground shook so violently that I was knocked off my feet, my friends tumbling around me. I turned to look. The force of the explosion had blasted our lunchroom door off its hinges. Hot air and flames licked down the catwalk toward us. Get up, 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 screamed Katerina, pulling on my arms. I stumbled to my feet, as did Xenia behind me. Mary was the farthest down the catwalk, and she got to the exit door first. She pulled it open, and we all tumbled out into the main entryway of the factory, collapsing in a heap with smoke billowing out behind us. Hands pulled at us. Air raid sirens blared, but I could hear the rumble of bricks and mortar falling around us. All at once, I gulped in cold, fresh air. I looked up and counted. All six of us were there. We had miraculously survived the bombing. Young boys with Hitler's youth armbands herded us away from the building and told us to stand with factory workers in the, from the main wing. We milled about, shocked and frightened, blood trickling from our wounds. I took huge, gulping breaths to calm myself and willed myself not to cry. Xenia and Bibi were standing a few feet apart from the other workers, pointing to part of the factory. I turned to look and gasped. One third of it had been bombed flat, and where our bomb room had been was now a hollowed out shell. My first thought was one of frustration. All those sabotage bombs had been destroyed, all that trickery for nothing. My second thought was exul exultation. Maybe the bombs didn't get used, but I was sure we had saved many laborers' lives here today by wetting the gunpowder. But then I wondered, how long would it take the officers in charge to realize that had those bombs been real, they would have exploded when the Allies' bomb hit it? The damage would have been far worse than this. What would they do to us when they realized what we had done to the German bombs? I looked over at Xenia. She met my eyes and nodded slightly. She was wondering the same thing. You, out of the way. I looked up. A Nazi officer with an impatient frown on his face was pushing his way through. His black dress uniform was crisply pressed, and his boots and brass were so polished they sparkled in the sunlight despite the smoke. He seemed out of place in the burning rubble. You and you, he pointed to a couple of the older Hitler youth. Get the first aid kit. You, he said, turning to a factory supervisor. Where's the fire hose? Katerina limped over to where I stood and leaned heavily against my side. I sprained my ankle. In the haze of the smoke, I saw flashes of red. 
Natalia's scalp had been cut, and Mary's hand. A long black car sat idling at the entrance of the factory. The officers, I'd assumed. I watched as the glass in the rear window rolled down. A woman, her blonde curls styled to perfection, stuck her head out. Franz, she called out, we will be late for the rally. The officer glanced her way, then waved his gloved hand as if warding off a fly. The woman's head disappeared into the depths of the car. A young girl with blonde braids looked out the window. She said something to someone inside. A second blonde head appeared. The sight of her stopped my heart. But where had I seen her before? Right at that moment, she squinted. Her eyes locked onto mine. A look of panic transformed her face, and she stretched her arms out to me. She said something that was lost in the tumult, but her lips seemed to say, Lida, please don't leave me. Was I dreaming? I waved, too stunned to even take a step toward her. She waved back. Suddenly, both blonde heads disappeared. I could see the woman scolding them as the window rolled up. Could that have been Larissa? My Larissa? But in the car of a Nazi officer? No. How could it possibly have been my sister? And we'll pick up tomorrow with our last chapter before spring break. See you then.